Hey church, we have just two weeks left in our But Why series, so we'll close that out next week. For today, the passage and the topic that we're going to look at today has been described by uh, the late Michael Eaton as the inevitable consequence of the gospel. And I think for the last couple of weeks, the last four weeks or so, we've been talking about consequences of the gospel. Uh, prior to that, we were really just zeroing in on the gospel message itself. So Christ died for our sins in order to divert the wrath of God from us to him and to absorb it, to pay the debt for our sin, to deal with our shame, and ultimately to triumph over evil. But in the last couple of weeks, we've really looked at some of the consequences of being forgiven and what that means for us in our lives now. So for example, last week, we looked at the passage that said that we have been purified by the blood of Christ and as a consequence have become a people zealous and passionate for good works. So today we're going to look at another consequence of the gospel and this time it relates to how we do life together as a church. So let's read together Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11 all the way up to verse 22. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. How bad is that? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility." And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom this whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So there's a lot of repetition of words and ideas and phrases in that passage. It's a swirling concoction of one of the most profound consequences of the gospel. And it goes something like this. Two, division, separation, hostility. Jesus, Peace, unity, one. The hostility that existed between these two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, was just kind of a well-attested fact in the ancient world. And it doesn't take much of an imagination for us to think about hostility that exists between two racial groups. Every single country in the world has experienced this, and of course we've experienced this in our country as well. And what is being described in this passage is a joining together of two groups of people known for their hostility in such a profound way that it could only be as a consequence of the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
It's therefore not this verse and this message today is therefore not just kind of a trendy political statement on racial unity. It speaks to something so profound. It's more than just the ability to dwell in proximity without killing each other. It's a profound joining together and a dramatic removal of hostility that exists between racial groups. Just listen to verse 14 to 16 again. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by destroying the ordinances so that he could create in his place one new man, place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So the question for the series is, but why? Why did Jesus die? Well, one reason is that through the cross, groups of people separated with hostility that exists between them could become one with that hostility removed. This is an inevitable consequence of the gospel. Do you realize there's a difference between a consequence and a side effect? So I think sometimes when it comes to this subject of racial unity in the gospel, we uh, perhaps tend to think of it as, as a kind of a side effect. So when it comes to the area of medicine, a side effect is uh, an effect of the medicine um, that, that happens as a result of the medicine, but it's not the principal intended effect. So it happens as a result, but it's not what was uh, intended. And I think sometimes when it comes to the gospel, there may be some instances of side effects of the gospel. So things that happen that are maybe good, but it's not the principal intended effect of the gospel. So for example, I think back to uh, you know when I, my, my group of school friends. So we've still stayed friends through university and through now we keep in touch. And when we were in our more serious dating phase, um, there was a there was a time when guys used to talk about uh, man they really wanted to to date church chicks. Uh, and I realized that sounds super derogatory. It's not the most flattering of terminology, but um, really what it what they were saying is they had just realized that uh, Christian girls, and most of the guys weren't Christian themselves, but they just realized that Christian girls were, were kind and nice and not nasty, and that's what they, they were saying. And to be sure, there is a profound and dramatic change in our character when we come to Jesus that affects things like we become patient and we become kind and gentle, and all these fruits of the Spirit that are appealing, but it certainly is not a principal intended effect of the gospel that you would become more attractive to the opposite sex, right? A consequence is far different to a side effect because a consequence is it is intended that this would happen as a result of of the cause. It is entirely intentional. So it's not a side, we're not talking about a side effect here. We're talking about an intended consequence of the death of Jesus. And in fact, if we dig into this a little bit deeper, this may be, you know, harping on a little bit here, but there's even a difference between a consequence and an effect. It's so not just the difference between consequence and side effect, but there's a difference between a consequence and an effect. And the difference is this. So an effect is something that happens as a result of a cause, but the difference between effect and consequence is that an effect can have multiple causes. So for example, I'm not really tired today. Well, that could be a result of many things. It could be a result of lack of sleep. It could be a result of I didn't eat properly. It could be a result of, you know, MROs kept us up like all night. Like it's an effect because there are multiple possible causes. But a consequence is tied to a particular cause. It will only happen if that one cause is in place. And that's why I love this statement that racial unity is an inevitable 
consequence of the gospel because it is only the cause of the death of Jesus Christ that has the effect of deep unity between racial groups. It is only through the broken flesh of Jesus, that's what this passage is saying, that the two can become a brand new one and that hostility can be removed. And I want to just spend the rest of our time this morning just telling you uh, why I believe that, just why this passage speaks about it's only possible, it is a consequence only of the death of Jesus that this can be achieved. And, and there's two main reasons for that given in our text. So the first of them is that it's what our passage says is that it's only through the broken flesh of Jesus that hostility can be removed. So verse 17 says that Jesus makes peace. Verse 15 says that Jesus preaches peace. But verse 14 says Jesus is our peace. He is the substance of peace. In other words, peace is not possible apart from Jesus. And I want to say that, that applies to all of life. That applies to your personal life. That applies to the political situation in the Middle East. And that applies to racial unity. True peace is only possible through Jesus because he is our peace. So verse 14 says that he has broken down in his flesh. So speaking about the cross, when he died, he was broken down in that moment, the dividing wall of hostility. Now that phrase, dividing wall of hostility, is not just a metaphor. He's not just trying to be dramatic. There was a literal wall of hostility that Paul is referring to here. So I think most of us know that, that at the time in the temple, uh, there was the Holy of Holies, and it was very closely guarded or divided from the rest of the temple. And there was strict access given to that particular place. And so women could not enter into it, and different racial groups could not enter into it. It was only the Jewish men who could go in. But what little people know is that on the outside of that wall that divided that particular area of the temple was this inscription that we found on multiple archaeological sites. It says this, let no one of any other nation come within the fence and barrier around the holy place. Whoever is caught doing so will himself be responsible for the fact that his death will ensue. How's that for a literal dividing wall of hostility? If you're not a Jew, you come over this wall, we're not responsible for the fact that your death will ensue. And I mean, this is not un unusual that we have these dividing walls of hostility. I think of just the Berlin Wall, of a, a couple hundred people that died as they tried to make their way from East to West Germany and were shot on sight. Here is a literal dividing wall of hostility in the temple. And I like to think about this, that when Jesus died and the temple veil was torn in two, providing access into the Holy of Holies, that is the essence of the gospel message. That's primary. We now have access to God. We're not separated from this veil. As that was torn, I like to think of in the same way the death of Jesus as Paul is describing here in his flesh, that in the same way that dividing wall of hostility was broken down. It is only the death of Jesus that destroys hostility. In fact, the word used here in verse 16 says the death of Jesus killed the hostility, which is fascinating for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, firstly, uh, I mean, you've got to pick this up, the irony, right? <laughs> Killing hostility. It's a kind of hostile language uh, to neutralize hostility, but it really just speaks to just how passionate this subject is. It's saying Jesus smashed Hostility. 
It also speaks to the idea he didn't just dismantle this dividing wall so that it could be rebuilt again by us. He rendered it useless once and for all. And a third really interesting thing about the language used here is when Paul says he broke down the wall of hostility, the word used there is literally the word for loosed. He loosed that wall. You think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah. I mean, the reality is, in Greek, the language of the time, there were other words Paul could have chosen to use for breaking down a wall. But he used the word loosed, which is really strange because that word is used throughout the New Testament to refer to being loosed from demonic oppression. Every time. You've been loosed from oppression. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't. He has loosed something dramatic that has held back his church. The reality is this. If we ever build up walls that Jesus died to demolish, then we are posturing ourselves against the entire flow of redemptive history. And you do not... You do not want to do that. Heaven's powers are unleashed against these systems of oppression. So that's the first thing we see in this passage. About it's only through the death of Jesus. It's because that's the only way that true hostility is removed. But secondly, it's only through the death of Jesus that true new unity can happen. See, remember from last week, whenever the Bible talks about things being broken down, it then always talks about building something new in its place. You remember that? Well, the reality is peace is not just the absence, the absence of hostility. We saw that in our Fruit of the Spirit daily devotional. Peace is not just the absence of hostility. True peace is when something new and beautiful is created in its place. And verse 14 to 15 describes it. In fact, it's described multiple times here where the two separated groups that were hostile, now that hostility has been removed through the death of Jesus, but now these two groups are being joined together into one new group, one new man. That's what verse 15 says, that he might create in himself Only in himself can this happen. He might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Again, I want to point out just a couple of interesting things about that statement. Where else will you read the phrase, two now become one? That's right. You got it. Just turn over the page. Chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, which says, Therefore, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and the two shall become one. It's the same language being used just a page before that. Now, I'm not saying that the nature of our interracial relationships is of the same nature of a husband and a wife in a marriage, but it certainly does talk about a kind of connection and relationship that is far more than just being able to be in proximity with each other. But it speaks to this idea of mutual respect, of working for the good of one another, of trust, of love. That's certainly what Paul has in mind here when he talks about the two now becoming one. That's the first interesting thing about that particular choice of word. The second thing is the word new. I mean, you will just love the word new. It's just say new and it's, it just makes you happy. Right? But, but you can use, we use the word new in, in many different ways. So I could say, hey, I got a marvelous new bike. I did about a year ago. Uh, so it was a marvelous new bike, but actually it was secondhand. But still, you know, it was new for me. Or I could say, you know, I got a new pair of jeans. You know, I'm not saying that I've never had a pair of jeans in my life. I'm just saying I have a newer pair. I have a replacement pair, but I'm, I'm saying it's a, a new pair of jeans. I'm also not saying that this pair of jeans I'm wearing is new. It's never existed in the history of the world. It's a brand new thing, new jeans. I mean, 
You imagine that day when jeans first came on the scene. Hey, you all used to wearing pants. Now he has this new thing. Check it out. These are jeans. They look much cooler and they're much like stronger. Wow, you know, we use the word new in that sense. It's never before happened and now look new. So in the original language of the Bible, it's so amazing because there are actually precise words for each of those different ways that we use the word new. And guess what? When Paul says one new man in place of the two, he's specifically using a word that means new as in you've never seen it before. It's brand new. Look, I'm doing a brand new. It's unlike anything you've seen before. It's new and it is beautiful. Speaking of a a new way of thinking about culture, a new racial, cultural identity has been created between two groups where there was hostility. Now the hostility is removed, and now there's a new cultural identity. And I want to dwell on that uh, for a little bit because it's really important. What it, what it means is this. When you become a Christian, your identity changes. We've spoken about that in this series and had gone forever about that. Your personal identity changes, but your cultural identity also changes. You receive a new primary cultural identifier. You are now known, primarily should be known, as a citizen of the kingdom of God. That becomes your new primary national cultural identifier. Now I say primary because we don't lose our other worldly natural identifiers. Like we're still going to be, I'm still going to be a white middle-aged male. And Zwei's still going to be a black man. We still re- retain our natural cultural identifiers, but they are no longer our primary cultural identifiers. They have been superseded by a new cultural identity that defines us at a far deeper level. So what that means is, in reality, I have more in common with a black, elderly woman living in the rural areas of the Eastern Cape that's a Christian than I do with the white, middle-aged man living in Johannesburg that's not a Christian. I have more in common with her because she's a Christian than I do with people of my secondary cultural identifiers. That's the idea behind this new thing Jesus is building. It retains its diversity. It retains its flavor. But we are no longer primarily known by that anymore. So his death is what removes, kills hostility. It's only when we appropriate that death. It's only Christians who can live like this. And it's, I like to think of his resurrection as that is building a whole bunch of newness. That is building this new kingdom where we are known as fellow citizens. Verse 19 or 20 says, members of the household of God. That's our new primary cultural identifier. This is an inevitable consequence of the gospel. And I love that he put the word in there, inevitable. Because whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, this is where redemptive history is heading. So when we, when we look at scripture that talks about when this is all wrapped up in the end, and we're gathered together in this eternal space, what will that gathering of people look like? Well, we know. Revelation 7, verse 9 to 10. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, 
from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with right robes, purified with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now listen, when we as a church, when we intentionally point ourselves in the direction in which redemptive history is definitively flowing, then we can expect that God is going to fill our sails, <laughs> that there is going to be a momentum, that there is going to be the power of God behind that. And I know that for sure, because that's what the passage goes on to talk about in verse 20 through to 22, that the Holy Spirit is building a dwelling place for God by His Spirit that's like this. God very happily dwells in places like this, where we, there is this intentional posturing in this direction of racial unity, of dividing walls of hostility being broken down, of people being known primarily as citizens of the kingdom of God and as members of the exact same household. God happily dwells in places like that, and the Spirit happily makes those efforts happen. I want to pray now as we pray for ourselves and for our church. And in fact, what I want to use for our prayer is what Dave shared in his prayer, because just from the next chapter, it's in the context of pursuing racial unity. Now to him, he's able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. God, we pray as we gather before you that you would fill us as a church, as we, as I know this church has set itself in this direction with intentionality. And God, as we today are just reminded or perhaps realizing to a far deeper extent this inevitable consequence of the gospel, this inevitable sweep of history, God, I pray just firstly individually This is a simple idea, but it's so difficult. It confronts so much at the roots of who we are, this confrontation with what we thought were primary identifiers. And so much history and so much difficulty, so much hostility, so much hatred, so much anger, so much distance, so much separation. But Jesus, we gather before you today just acknowledging that in your flesh, when you died, a true historical event, that you were deliberately breaking down walls. And in your glorious resurrection, you were deliberately making one new thing in place of the two. And so we just submit ourselves before you and we give up our rebellion against us and just happily turn ourselves in the opposite direction and willingly float in the current of your redemptive history. And I know that this will only truly happen when we depend on, when we appropriate your death on our behalf. And so I pray, God, for forgiveness, for bitterness, for unforgiveness, for enmity that we've held in our hearts towards other people, and particularly in the context of today, towards people from other racial groups. You died to forgive us of this. And so we pray you would purify us and make us a people zealous for this particular good work. As we trust you, Holy Spirit, as we trust you to build something new in our personal lives, to replace that division and that enmity and that anger and all that we've held on to and replace it with love and affection and a deep sense of peace, God, would your peace descend upon us. Jesus, you announced peace. You make peace possible. You are peace. 
And we are determined to know nothing but you and you crucified in our midst. And so we pray that these waves of the consequences of your death and resurrection, these waves would ripple out and we would just give up in the face of that. And allow for that transform, this transforming effects, transforming consequences, these intentional consequences to overcome us. So forgive us and build something new in us individually. And God, I pray for us as a church. I know that this will be one of the greatest testaments to your death, Lord Jesus, is us as a church embracing this and demonstrating it. And that's what we want, Lord Jesus, for you to be magnified and glorified. Help us to do this for your namesake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.